Welcome to this ISP Roundtable. Uh, my name is Giovanni Carboni, I'm head of the Africa program at ISPI. Today we shall discuss the relationship between geopolitics and security in the Central Sahel, um, an area where one of Africa's major crises has been dragging on for a, a decade. Uh, we do this on the occasion of a publication of, a, uh, of an ISPI report on the Sahel, uh, a report entitled Sahel, 10 Years of Instability. The report was realized uh, with the support of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and can be freely downloaded from the ESP website. Um, I would like to introduce and welcome our four speakers today. They are Niagale Bagayoko, Senior Expert and Chair at the African Security Sector Network, uh, Ivan Guishawa, Senior Lecturer at the University of Kent, uh, Tatiana Smirnova, Researcher at the Centre Franco P, uh, and Dennis Tal, Senior Associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. I'm also glad to welcome Ambassador Giuseppe Mistretta, who is Director General for, the Sub, for Sub-Saharan Africa at the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you all for accepting our uh, invitation for being here with, with us today. Uh, we have about 45 minutes to hear from our panelists, uh, uh, for them to address some key issues, and we'll then open the discussion to questions from the audience. So you are um, very much welcome to ask your questions um, on the different platforms that they are using to follow the streaming. I will now leave the floor to Ambassador Mistretta for a few opening remarks. Ambassador, please. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Giovanni and Ispi. I hope that you are hearing, hearing me well. Give me a sign if, if it's, everything is okay. Yes. I go on. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, I would say that since I've been in this ministry for the last 40 years almost, Sahel has always been a difficult neighborhood. And uh, unfortunately, now maybe it's more difficult than ever because now... Uh, with the traditional problems such as drought or poverty, we add criminality, terrorism, and uh, uh, everything in the framework of the Ukrainian uh, invasion, Ukrainian war. So uh, the complication is big and the challenge is huge. Um, it's already many, it has been already many years in which people talk about the scramble for Africa, the new scramble for Africa, and Sahel certainly is one of the region which is target of the new scramble for Africa, in which we have many new actors. Uh, and not from now, from since many years, since five, six years, we have the attention of new actors, such as Russia, first of all, um, which now, because of the war, is the most concerning, but also the Gulf state, China, Turkey, etc. Especially now the problem is the attention of Russia, of Russia, especially because immediately after this attention, the Ukrainian war started. And so everything is now uh, in the framework of the war. And so a little bit more dangerous for all of us. Um, of course, these new actors, I, I, I I concentrated my attention on the new actors in the Sahel and in Africa, generally speaking, for some years now. And uh, the characteristic of the new actors uh, um, is that they are, let's say, at least uh, dirigistic countries uh, in which the rules of parliamentary democracy are not uh, really the, the main one. And in which decisions are, are taken very quickly without lobbies, uh, opposition, uh, uh, newspapers against this, uh, this decision taken. And so, um, for some reason, for the uh, rapid uh, intervention of, uh, in their actions, they are sometimes uh, considered more effective than the European slow process procedure. And this is the real challenge. I mean, how to convince and how to maintain our grip uh, our grip, our relation, our partnership with the African countries in Sahel, when the impression is that the new actors are much more effective than the old actors, and, and among the old actors there is certainly Europe. Um, I believe now I see a lot of re relativism, if I can say so, in the attitude of uh, European leaders, such as uh, to tolerate uh, the autocracies, tolerate the coup d'etat, because we don't have to 
uh, we, are, we are in competition actually with the new actors, so uh, it's better not to be too tough on principles. Well, I think that this is the exact the recipe for uh, for uh, um, failure. Uh, Europe is founded uh, thanks to the pillars of uh, good values, uh, good government. I don't say democracy because democracy is in crisis also in Europe and in the Western countries, but good governance and uh, and uh, the human rights, etc. And so I think that Europe should stick is typical intervention, which is on one side a big contributor for cooperation and for development and for invest investment, and on the other side, very careful about the growth of, of, of principle, good governance, and uh, and uh, human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then they repeat, I don't stress too much democracy because we know that in Africa elections don't mean uh, elections don't mean real democracy, and also in Europe there are some. Uh, some there is some criticism. Um, so uh, I would say that actually in this moment, despite the scramble, the European Union, maybe together with the United States, is the only uh, provider of special attention on these uh, issues. I mean, the issues of good governance. Certainly, this is not the issue which is at, at the core of the action of Russia, the Gulf states, or Turkey, or or other new actors, as I specified uh, before. And, and I believe that really is important now, at the beginning of this conversation, that my introduction concentrate a lot on this. And I am supported in this idea, and I finish with this remark, by the opinion of our Prime Minister Draghi, Mario Draghi, who recently, when he was awarded in New York as a special man of the year, um, he said that, uh, among the many, the many things that he said, he said one very uh, important thing, that we should not permit a situation towards autocracies. Uh, autocracies in the Sahel, we had six coup d'etat uh, con consecutively. Uh, the, the way in which we relate, uh, our, our relations with those autocracy, autocracies now is um, what we will see in the future in the balance of power between uh, the new actors and Europe. So no hesitation uh, uh, toward autocracies. And in my opinion, uh, really, I feel uh, rewarded by these remarks because it's exactly what I think. Uh, I, don't, I know that I have very limited time for my introduction. I thank you again for the uh, possibility to, to address um, this audience. And thank you again, and congratulations for the initiative. Grazie. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you for your opening that pointed um, already at some of the things that are at stake in the Sahel. Let me now turn to Nyagale. Uh, Nyagale, uh, the, the, the situation in the Sahel is, of course, very complex and also change. It's been changing um, um, over time, continuously. Um, can you um, add to what uh, the ambassador said, uh, just and to give us some, something more on the big picture. Um, what is the current situation? How did we get there? Uh, what are the, the, the key points that we should, we can start from? Nyagale, you should please uh, switch on your microphone. Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't, sorry. Uh, yes, um, in fact, uh, Unfortunately, as uh, the security and political situation uh, has been uh, even always more deteriorating uh, in the last past years, uh, we can see that from a security crisis initially uh, located in the northern part of Mali, we uh, presently do have a security situation which has uh, first expanded to central Mali, uh, then to uh, northern and uh, eastern uh, Burkina Faso and uh, western Niger, and um, increasingly to coastal uh, countries and the northern parts of uh, Benin, Togo, um, Côte d'Ivoire, and uh, in some extent uh, Ghana uh, as well. Uh, what is very important in my view is uh, uh, also uh, to understand that uh, this uh, crisis uh, is multidimensional. Uh, it is absolutely 
single thing, not possible, only to read it, only uh, the, lens, the only lens uh, of uh, countering uh, terrorism. Uh, because, of course, you do have jihadi uh, movement, which are uh, all each day uh, much more uh, powerful and uh, which are expanding uh, both their influence and the territorial uh, presence. Uh, but also uh, you do have uh, the importance of uh, rebel groups, uh, particularly in the northern part uh, of uh, Mali, still with the uh, Tuareg uh, leaders. Uh, you also do have the importance of uh, self-defense militias, uh, which have been uh, growing in importance uh, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, and uh, in a lesser extent uh, in Niger. Uh, you also have uh, lots of uh, criminal uh, movement. And uh, we have seen that in addition to that, the governance and political uh, structure of the region uh, has also changed a lot over the last past two years. Uh, with the coups which have uh, arised uh, in uh, three countries uh, of the region. But just very quickly, uh, if I can uh, add something to uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Misretta um, just said, I think, yes, of course, Russia is important and uh, uh, the role of external actors is uh, has to be taken into account, but uh, let's be careful not to read the crisis under external lenses, because in my view, it is part of the failure of all international actors which have tended to apply their own uh, perspective on very local realities. So yes, Russia is one of the dimension, dimension of the situation today, but let's not push too much stress uh, on it. Thank you, Nyagale. Um, Ivan, uh, one of the major actors, or, or well, I might say by far, the actor that uh, was uh, uh, most involved in the area, um, the external actor, of course, has been France. France intervened uh, some 10 years ago. It was called in by the government in Bamako. Um, and then it, it, it also, the, the approach that uh, France adopted also evolved over time with the uh, with, uh, different operations been been uh, been been started by Paris uh, what did Paris achieve in the Sahel and what did it fail to achieve so yeah I may start um, the history backward by looking at what has just happened in recent months um, France has been kicked out of Mali um, you may argue and that was not the plan so uh, France was definitely willing to stay and continue to uh, deploy its forces to conduct uh, counterterrorism operations. And this has not been happening according to plans. France is now re-articulating its uh, military forces uh, in uh, places outside uh, Mali. So um, the major message that was sent from the Sahel in recent times is a message that is not very, very positive uh, toward France, in fact. Um, so uh, France, as you said, started operating militarily in the Sahel and in Mali in particular in 2013. And it was what you may argue um, a very kinetic um, operations in the sense that the early phase of the French presence consisted of kicking out some uh, jihadist movements that had um, taken control of northern Mali. And until this operation was over, in fact, the goals of France were very, very clear. The point was to restore uh, Malian um, territorial integrity, and that worked pretty well. And after that, the uh, French operation transformed into uh, what has been called uh, the Bakan operation, which uh, or whose goals were perhaps less clear. Uh, if you uh, would ask the French at the time what the points of this operation was, they would tell you, well, our point is to make the jihadists weaker and to make the uh, Sahelian armies stronger. And already you see um, some vagueness in the goals that were assigned to the French operation. 
uh, it takes a lot of time to um, rebuild or contribute to uh, put back on their feet armies that um, um, had, I mean, were institutionally very, very weak. And when it comes to um, weakening the jihadists, uh, what we've seen is uh, operations mainly consisting of removing leaders. So when you take these two goals already, you have some ambiguities and you have some um, um, unclear um, uh, objectives. But then what happened next, as you said, is that France kept trying to um, adjust uh, its operations according to the political development in the region. Uh, France tried to involve uh, European partners, try to also um, introduce some economic packages that uh, were supposed to um, come and strengthen the military effort. So um, there was an effort to do some sort of state building, even though it was relatively messy. And eventually you may argue that the failure of France, uh, because um, I think there's no way you cannot call it a failure, uh, was to um, indulge into some sort of hubristic uh, state building efforts. Guys coming from the outside and pretending that they know better what to do um, in uh, places that they um, fundamentally don't know well. Uh, at least the political aspects uh, were unknown and overlooked, I think, by uh, the French. And the kind of state and regimes that France contributed to prop up were eventually... Um, very unpopular among the uh, public opinions. And this is the part that the French did not look at very carefully, like the perceptions of the public opinions and their relationships toward their own states. Thank you, Ivan. We'll come back to the question of the, uh, how popular uh, the French presence in the Sahel has been. Uh, but the question is that uh, that lack of, of popularity, of acceptance somehow, contributed to France being kicked out from Mali, as, as you mentioned. And Russia somehow stepped in. So let me now turn to um, Tatiana. Tatiana Zmirnova, researcher from the Centre franco Uh Tatiana, uh, what does the fact that Russia, as, as I said, as we said, um, tried to uh, expand its influence in the region signal. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what is the security dimension of Russia's um, policy in Africa and in the Sahel in particular? Please, we cannot hear you. The microphone, thanks. Okay, yeah. So, yes, thank you for the question. Actually, Russia's presence in the Sahel signals many things. I think that the main uh, things um, could, be, could be identified as, like, first is the need for deep changes within models of governance in the Sahel. And second, it is increasing tolerance to structural, symbolic, and physical violence in the region. And both of these points explain the growing attractiveness to the Russian offer, to the Russian counter-terrorism strategy promoted by Kremlin in, in the areas affected by, by conflict. So, in, in, indeed, Russian counter-terrorism program, programs are, are sincerely perceived as being the best alternative to Western security uh, presence. And as other speakers pointed out, um, uh, while conflict continues to expand in the Sahel, a lack of impact on the ground has fueled doubts about the reasons of Western military presence. And these feelings of hopelessness and despair um, increase the attractiveness of, to Ru of Russian solutions. And these solutions are portrayed by Kremlin's propaganda as quick and efficient. Um, Russia has invested a lot of its soft power in the promotion of its leadership role in the arena of international security. For example, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism is a Russian diplomat. Uh, Russia is also putting much effort in propaganda campaigns, uh, presenting to external audiences, specifically in Africa, its military operations in Syria, and uh, most recently in Central African Republic as success stories. We have all heard about this tourist film. 
Um, at the same time, the extensive disinformation campaigns are led through social media in different regions in the Sahel with different impact. In Mali, it had the most maybe important effect, invisible impact. Well, Russia's counterterrorism actions have relied specifically on its military modus operandi, operandi emphasizing punitive measures at the expense of broader social economic approaches. Uh, an important uh, principle of this uh, approach is that it is based on experiences from fighting the Chechen nationalist resistance. At that time, Moscow's primary purpose was to preserve the territorial integrity of the Russian Federation. And I think it is very important that this impetus is attractive to some elites in the current situation in the Sahel. So this extensive military heavy approach to tackling the insurgency has already been widely criticized by local human rights organizations uh, like the Barkhan and so on, that this, this was very criticized. How, how in these circumstances it can be explained the attractiveness of the Russian military punitive approach in within the region and the Sahel. Of course, uh, this, uh, this, uh, it is very it is perceived in a different way we will we can uh, talk about it a bit later so um, the attractiveness of the Russian over can be explained by the needs of deep changes within models of governance and uh, the capacity of some elites to exploit and to capture this need in their own political interests um, and well, we can say that to a certain extent, the wave of military coups that we are witnessing is a clear interest of this deep need and of this um, and, and of how this need is being currently exploited. Um, at the same time, so um, this image of strong man, as I said, yes, it is exploited both by Kremlin and uh, it is also exploited by Kremlin. Um, uh, but it is also important to say that the Kremlin's project and its counter-terrorist modus operandi will continue to find its audience in the Sahel, uh, because it is strangely, uh, to a certain extent, we can say it is strangely accepted by the populations, despite uh, atrocities committed by Russian troops in Ukraine. Um, and it can Thank be- Thank you, Satana. let me interrupt you. <laughs> Um, here, thank you, and you gave us a perspective th that um, is not always uh, the, the the one that is adopted by observers. So I also want uh, our um, uh, speakers, the other speakers, to maybe react to that. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, wh when I say that it's not uh, the, the 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 dominant perspective, is that uh, you tend to. It seems to me to stress. Uh, the will on the part of Moscow uh, to become a leader uh, in security issues in the area uh, and to uh, downplay its will to compete, um, to see this as an opportunity to compete and, and um, take away influence uh, from uh, Western countries. Um, but I leave this to the other speakers if they want to come back to this point. Uh, Dennis. Uh, Dennis Stahl, uh, Senior Associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Uh, let me ask you about uh, another actor, the European Union, which has been uh, an actor in the region for, for quite a long time. Um, but how has it been an actor? What are the drivers behind its initiatives in the region? And are there different views among uh, EU member states on what um, should be done in the Sahel? Uh, thank you, Giovanni. I think I think we can talk about the European Union, but I think we also need to take into account uh, the different member states, and then we can see what the European involvement ha has been. And I think there was a great diversity of interests of getting involved in the Sahel uh, beyond counterterrorism and, and migration, which have also figured prominently in, in the discourse, of course. But if you look, for example, at Germany, 
uh, uh, it, it was a variety of motives, uh, being a good multilateralist, uh, being solid, solid uh, being a solidarity partner with, with, uh, with France, um, uh, to some extent domestic politics linked to the 2015 refugee crisis, but even that date suggests that uh, it came later and that involvement in Mali started in 2013. And I think the same complexity we see also see that there's not one single cause in the task force to Cuba, uh, which was a uh, multinational uh, European uh, operation providing security force assistance uh, to Mali, which was launched by France with it for its own reasons that I will not get into now for, for reasons of time, but it, it managed to mobilize 10 countries uh, that joined them in this um, military operation. And here we clearly see a diversity of interests. Uh, countries which had already a relatively large footprint in, in like uh, Denmark and Sweden, considered uh, perhaps um, Takuba as a useful complement for their uh, overall involvement in, in the region. But, but most, I would argue, uh, troop contributing countries in Takuba had very, li very limited direct interests and a limited footprint too. And, um, and my interviews that I conducted with policymakers and officials from these countries suggest that uh, their primary primary motive was actually very much uh, alliance politics and, and contribution warfare. That is to say, to contribute to that French effort to strengthen uh, defense and, de and, and diplomatic uh, cooperation with France as a center of, of gravity um, in Europe in the face of an ever-increasing uh, instability in international politics and in Europe's uh, vicinity. And, and by contributing to that effort, they were trying to show that they were good, loyal, and, and useful partners to a major European power and potentially an important security provider. Um, and so contributing to Takuba was then an investment in, in national defense at home. And uh, I think that is something that has to be taken uh, into account. And um, I'm not suggesting that this can be reduced to this uh, factor of alliance politics uh, alone, but it is certainly uh, a major factor. And I think what what we learn from that is that these types of interests, which have not so much to do with the Sahel and the problems there itself, uh, shape, of course, the, the different contributions of European countries. Um, and they may also, I think, um, explain to some extent this, uh, this weak or apparent absence of a unity of purpose among Europeans. Yes, they, they showed up massively in the Sahel, both individually within the UN, the EU as such, of course, as an institution with, with different missions and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, also as an ad hoc coalition that I just referred to, Takuba. But I think overall, we have more of an assem uh, ass assemblage of, 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 of activities that are perhaps not adding up uh, uh, or not perhaps greater than the sum of its parts in the end. And I think that has been uh, a deficiency in, in the European approach to the Sahel. Thank you, Dennis. And let me add that you wrote an excellent chapter uh, on the top on the on the issues that you just chap that you just uh, touched upon uh, in our report in the report on the Sahel that we launched today, uh, Sahel: Ten Years of Instability. And let me re remind the audience that uh, the report can be freely downloaded from the ESP website. And I'd like now to uh, go back to Nyagale. Nyagale. The Sahel is an area uh, where challenges to democracy in Africa have been most evident, most clear-cut. Um, we normally, we very often hear talks, talk of um, democratic backsliding, but in the Sahel what we've actually seen is, uh, is um, full-fledged cases of abandonment of democracy, of democratic breakdown in the form of military coups, uh, which had been uh, um, in decline uh, across the African region. Why is it that here, in, in this uh, sub-region, uh, military coup uh, re-emerged uh, more than elsewhere in Africa? Uh, first, uh, I think it is important to realize uh, how um, 
failed. I've been considered uh, democratically uh, elected uh, leaders, uh, which uh, have been perceived uh, by uh, public opinions in their own countries, uh, have, having been absolutely unable uh, to promote uh, transparency, to promote uh, development, to pro promote uh, urbanization, to promote education, to promote justice, and of course, security uh, for all. And uh, it is, I think, also uh, very important to realize that the very focused, uh, ve very electoral, no, let's say, very uh, focused approach on elections only, which has been promoted uh, both by national and international leaders uh, has been absolutely problematic because, in fact, democracy uh, has mainly been uh, seen and presenting as consisting in organizing organizing a number of uh, ballots, uh, presidential, uh, legislative, or uh, local. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have seen that uh, key principles and norms and practices for democracies, such as freedom, uh, promotion of uh, rule of law, um, access to justice, in fact, have been completely overlooked, not only by governments, but also by uh, interna their international partners. Uh, and this, uh, I think, can explain uh, the fact that uh, today uh, democracy uh, in a growing number of Africa is no more seen uh, first as a way to uh, solve conflict, uh, organization, organizing a big uh, pre presidential election as uh, an exit strategy for a security crisis uh, is no more uh, seen as convincing for the population. And uh, uh, second, is neither, it is never seen as a way to improve personal uh, security uh, in a larger, uh, in a larger uh, sense uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, political and uh, physical uh, security. And uh, I think that is where uh, uh, is uh, uh, lying the problems we do have here, uh, because we saw that a number of uh, unconstitutional and civilian coups in the region have not uh, uh, provoked uh, any uh, significant reaction, uh, both uh, of uh, subregional or continental organizations such as uh, ECOVAS or the African Union, but neither of uh, international partners and uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, US or uh, Europe and once. And uh, I think uh, this can also explain the reason why it's been rather easy for a military agenda to save uh, power. Uh, we saw uh, that what happened uh, both uh, in Mali and also in Guinea, which is not necessarily uh, lo located in the Sahel region, but uh, still uh, has seen the same process where uh, uh, Boubaka, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita in Mali or Alpha Condé uh, have been majorly uh, rejected by uh, the population and finally uh, the military uh, step in. Uh, so I think it is very important to see the link between between the crisis of democracy and uh, the rise of uh, uh, military agenda, uh, and also to understand that the double standard uh, of uh, European uh, or US or Western uh, democracy uh, on the continent has also paved the way uh, to uh, make uh, such a seizure of power by military leaders uh, much more easy in my view. Thank you, Niagales. So you primarily point to the failure of elected leaders uh, in, in delivering uh, the supposed benefits of, uh, of, uh, of a, let's call it, democratic system with all uh, their weaknesses. Um, no, Ivan. no, but so, so, sorry, if I may, sorry. No, in my view, the most important thing is that democracy cannot be reduced to elections 
as it has been for years and as it's still. When I, I can hear that democracy is a particular question in Africa. No, in fact, everywhere democracy is not about procedures. It is about the way a number of norms and principles are effective. And it has been far for uh, the case uh, in most of uh, Western African countries, as a matter of fact. That, that's certainly correct. What I mean is that you don't, have the, you, you don't even try to have democracy if you don't have elections. That's a starting point. Absolutely. And when you, do, when you do away with elections uh, as uh, the military takes over, of course, you're farther away uh, from a democratic system than uh, when you have elections. But um, even uh, we had a, the, the latest coup in Burkina Faso less than a week ago. And Burkina Faso now has a record uh, eight coups since independence. That's Africa's, uh, the African country with the most uh, military coup uh, in its history. Um, what is the difference between the juntas in Mali and Burkina Faso? And if any, uh, in their relationships with the, uh, the external actors? Yes, well, there's a very interesting parallel to establish between Mali and Burkina Faso indeed, because we both witnessed in these countries what uh, people locally call a coup within the coup, right? So we had a coup in Mali in August 2020, which was followed by another coup perpetrated by the same people in May uh, 2021. And in the case of uh, Burkina Faso, we had a coup in uh, January uh, of this year, uh, which was followed by another coup uh, that happened in the past days, perpetrated by uh, different people. Um, so, um, yeah, two coups within the coups. Uh, in the case of Mali, what is absolutely striking is that the first coup was pretty much a sort of uh, opportunistic military takeover after a massive uh, social mobilization against corruption, against fraudulent elections, and um, in a way, the military just had to sort of um, reap the fruits that um, the protests had uh, prepared for them. Um, and the first phase uh, of um, this uh, military regime uh, had civilian leaders. This was rectified, as the Malians uh, say, in May 2021, after which the military took full control, they got rid of the prime minister and the president who were civilians, and they uh, ushered in uh, Russia as their privileged uh, security partner. So this so-called rectification of the transition that happened in uh, 2021 is um, the defining event of the um, um, trajectory of Mali recently. In the case of Burkina Faso, the story is slightly different. Uh, the coup happened in January uh, of this year after a massive military defeat. And you may argue that the uh, immediate reasons behind this coup had to do with the cohesion of the military institution and some deep divisions within the military institutions. There was not so much social mobilization that uh, accompanied the coup at the time. Now, what has been happening in recent days is very interesting. Uh, the second coup that happened uh, last weekend um, also follows a major military uh, defeat, uh, also follows the observation that um, there's no transformation of the security situation. The situation of Burkina Faso is absolutely horrendous huh? from a security perspective. Uh, we have most of the rural parts of the countries that are pretty much under the influence of the jihadists, uh, including a province in the north that is completely um, isolated. Uh, and um, that was, in fact, uh, the reason why the, the coup happened, arguably, because there was a convoy that was supposed to unblock this blockade uh, that was attacked and uh, resulted in uh, heavy losses among the military. So the new generation of military that uh, took over power in the recent days, uh, probably um, primarily... Um, follow um, intra-military rationale, you may argue. But what is very interesting is that 
during the events themselves, while they were perpetrating the coup, it was perhaps not clear that they could earn or gain the victory. And so they decided to put people in the streets. And in order to um, do that, they argued that the French were trying to stop the coup from happening. And that gave a totally new dimension to the coup. Uh, and the popular protests, in fact, finished the job that was initiated by the military, which is the exact opposite of the Malian scenario in August 2020. So the big question mark now uh, with Burkina Faso is whether these new military are going to uh, follow the Malian di direction and change their military alliances, their security alliances, and switch to the Russians. And I think, I mean, it's there's plenty of diplomatic activity right now precisely to persuade the military not to uh, follow the uh, Malian direction. And we have signals from the US, from the uh, EU, um, indicating that, well, I mean, this is our first job, like we need to uh, persuade these guys that, uh, in fact, they shouldn't go for the Russian strategy. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, let me stay on this issue of the military coup. Uh, Dennis, um, do you think they, there is also a question, maybe these coups also reflect uh, the fact that uh, there, there's a different perspective on, on, on uh, the need to open a dialogue with jihadists? Uh, do they? Uh, I mean, is dialogue with the jihadists uh, a viable option? Is this an option uh, that some governments in the region might want to follow, uh, maybe contrary to the view of uh, international actors? Um, yes, I think, uh, uh, of course, it is an option. Uh, and I think that's the subject where the discrepancies of European involvement in the Sahel or in Mali, at least, has been, has been really uh, significant on a rhetorical level. There's always this willingness to assist, uh, find solutions, uh, and the emphasis on, on the notion of, of local ownership. Uh, in reality, uh, on that very issue, there, there seems to be a tendency to, to want to impose a certain vision on, 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 on uh, society in Mali, especially where this has been the, the controversy, and to impose uh, um, limits on what is politically uh, acceptable. And, and so to say, perhaps pointedly, uh, Europeans welcome Malian agency, but only as long as it coheres with, with uh, their own views to some extent. Right. So uh, and that, uh, I think, has also reinforced uh, skepticism and, and certainly also accusations of Western or European hypocrisy. And and everybody will be familiar with, uh, uh, you know, Malian interlocutors telling uh, uh, Europeans that, uh, well, but you would negotiate with with terrorist groups to liberate hostages. You 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 negotiate with the Taliban in Afghanistan. So what are you talking about? Um I think, uh, and, and I hear I also rejoin what Nia Ghali said, uh, the explanation to some extent is that obsession or that centrality of this idea of, of terrorism in the Sahel. Uh, and here I, I hardly say anything original, but we have to, to, to take into account that these so-called jihadists have emerged amid a civil war, that uh, we may think of them as, as political actors or as rebels, as insurgents, so, although of course sometimes using terrorist methods, but these are these are things that, that we also I think need to consider, especially as Malians and Sahelians uh, consider them, although of course they also use that that term uh, terrorism, but um it's very disputed even who is a terrorist group in the Sahel and in Mali, especially. And I think foreigners and Malians do not necessarily uh, see eye to an eye on this. And um, 
And so this, this European vision has been quite prominent, although I also would say this is somewhat unfortunate because I think that European rejection, especially from France, but also others like Germany, a rejection of dialogue has not always been as firm and, and consistent than is often argued. And we know, for example, from, from diplomats, uh, perhaps at least in private conversations, also from publicly the, the former head of the, the French army, that these are issues that seem to be reasonable or seem to need to be considered, but it's a political choice and that choice has not been has not been taken. And so this is one of the discrepancies or divergences um, between local decision makers and, and strong currents, especially in Mayan society and, and, and foreigners. So um, my final point here is simply to say, of course, if, if Malian societies and political actors want to do it, want to try it, um, who could be, uh, I mean, I think we all here in this panel would probably say, uh, yes, it's worthwhile trying, although a lot of questions remain uh, uncertain as are, are the armed groups interested in this kind of dialogue, what be, would be negotiated. And, and finally, for the time being, I think that the situation on the bat, so-called battlefield is not, is not necessarily conducive uh, to, to, to negotiations. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Tatiana, back to you. Uh, Russia essentially supported the military in Burkina and, and in Mali. Uh, is, there a is there a Russia uh, strategy in Africa? Uh, and is, is there a, a different strategy for the Sahel or are the goals of Moscow in the Sahel the same as uh, its goals for Africa at large? Okay. Um, so first I would like to, to underline that there is no... Um, document in an open access on Russian policy in Africa. But uh, responding directly to your question, I would say that yes, there is a strategy, and this strategy is a loose one. And basically, it is uh, uh, constructed on two pillars, uh, as Russia is trying to position itself worldwide as a security and energy provider. And at the same time, this strategy is based in Africa, if we are talking about Africa, on a careful and very tactical exploitation, systematic exploitation of the failure of Western presence, specifically military presence, and also on a paradoxical encounter of interests between political and economic networks, both in Africa and in Kremlin. So, and basically Russian strategy is very difficult and complicated to assess because we, to assess with the same criteria as we used to consider because Russia's involvement is built on arrangements and on means that are very different from those uh, that we uh, from those that are usually used by traditional partners because in parallel to conventional relations uh, Russia explicitly relies on operations that go beyond certain legal principles. It's using mercenaries, private mercenary companies, electoral interference, um, vast disinformation campaigns, um, weapons experts, possibly in exchange for natural resources. So to a certain extent, I think that the patterns of this kind of bicephalous way of doing lay back to Russian politics in the Middle East in the beginning of the 2000s. So my main hypothesis is that Africa by itself is not an objective for Russia, but rather a theater of Russia's operations born out of a broader project of um, influence, expansion and of reconstruction of empire. However, it is important to underline that contrary to the Soviet Union, Russian actors, um, Russian um, actors are guided um, by a loose strategy. While Russia as a state um, has interests in Africa like economic and um, uh, as, sorry, I just wanted to, to, to say um, one thing, but contrary to the Soviet Union, it is important to say that um, Russia is not uh, 
um, investing in uh, in uh, in Africa. Like it's not building uh, uh, hospitals. It's not uh, investing in medical help or in uh, education in Africa itself. And Russian actors are guided by loose strategy. So while Russia has uh, state, uh, Russia as a state has interests in Africa, like economic and diplomatic, the actual and more important engagement is carried out by private business uh, connected to, to Kremlin. And this uh, specificity, meaning this private business, is contributed is contributing to weaken institutions and is reinforcing specific patronage networks interested in, in economic and conjectural political opportunities. To conclude on that, um, Russian interests in the Sahel are not so different uh, from its interests in elsewhere in Africa, but what is different it is means that Russia is using. In some countries, Russia is privileging conventional ties like in Ethiopia, Algeria, or Egypt, and in other uh, countries like uh, Sudan, Mali, uh, Central African Republic, relations are structured via less formal networks and with less conventional means. And um, this is specifically dangerous because Russia clearly seeks to uh, partnerships um, that are elite based and not um, um, and not by other means. And this is very dangerous for provided current situation. Uh, uh, specifically in the Sahel. Thank you, Tatiana. We have received uh, very many questions from our audience. Um, a couple of them ask about uh, anti-French sentiments in the Sahel, their evolution in both in the Sahel and in West Africa uh, at large, and how these sentiments are uh, affecting the initiatives of external actors. I I'd like to hear on this uh, from both uh, Ivan and Dennis. Ivan, you want to start? Yes, I'm fine with this question. I think that it's difficult to measure exactly the depth of this anti-French sentiment. What is notable, though, and directly observable, is that this anti-French sentiment is vocal, it's loud, and it has made its way to the top level of politics. And to me, that's the key element here, that leaders in the Sahel don't hesitate to um, voice um, their anger or their rejection uh, of uh, France uh, interference in their businesses. So this is a major, major change. Now, um, on the grassroots level, you may argue that um, the anti-French discourses circulate quite a lot. And it's easy to accuse the social media or some um, manipulation uh, from the outside as the main cause for this. Now, there's another element that I think should be taken on board, which is the fact that after 10 years, the French military presence has not translated into significant protection of the civilians. And this is something that comes, in fact, out of surveys that are carried out in places among people that are not exposed to the social media, but who don't just understand why their life is not changing and why they are still so exposed to uh, jihadist violence. And so you may argue that some conspiracy theories also emerge uh, from the bottom up from people who eventually conclude that the absence of protection is in fact linked to a possible connection or complicity between those supposed to protect you and the jihadists. Of course, I mean, this is not <laughs> exactly what is happening. There's no complicity between the French and the jihadists, but this idea has a lot of traction and is, I think, the product of a um, complete sense of um, dispossession and uh, misery among uh, Thank you. Let me stop. chunks of the population. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, Dennis, I want uh, to hear what you have to add on this point, but let me also read you um, an, an additional question that we received uh, on this same topic. The question is by Bruce Whitehouse, and it goes uh, like this. Can the, can the narrative enduring and powerful among Sahelian elites 
that French strategic interests are inimical to African states and their sovereignty be undone? Well, that's an easy one. Uh, I think I think for the time being, this looks very implausible uh, because exactly this, this uh, sentiment uh, or this discourse has strong historical depth, I think, uh, which goes much beyond um, the, the, the current situation and the poor balance sheet that Yvonne just described. I think it has greatly contributed to that, but I think it echoes also who France is or what France stands for in the region in the mindset of a lot of citizens. And so to, to turn Turn this around uh, will be a, 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 a challenge for for a lifetime or two or three or four, um, and I think uh, you can see somewhat contradictory that Macron is, is trying some corrective measures, you know, like announcing the reform of the France CFA, which has to be become, which has also become uh, in recent years a strong rallying point for for uh, these uh, anti-French discourses and neo-colonial uh, uh, domination. But I think it will be very very uh, difficult in the short term uh, to to do so, and uh, and that really points to that historical depth, uh, political depth of, of of that problem that France has. And for me, um, Mali really stands for a very deep rupture in 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 this post-colonial relationship uh, in the region thank you there's a question specifically for ambassador mistretta uh, giuseppe can you hear us uh, please switch on your microphone thank you the question is by gian fabrizio ladini and he asks uh, where do we stand on the permanent strategic framework uh strategic permanent that Italy facilitated in Mali? This is a very uh, usual question when we talk about Mali. I don't know why uh, this is the focal attention. The, this is not something that was, um, uh, let's say, supported or in any case organized by our ministry. This is the activity of an um, NGO whose name is Arapashis that um, within its activities uh, has the um, attention for the Mali situation, Tuareg situation, etc. And they organized a meeting, a couple of meetings in Rome some time ago. Maybe they will reorganize one during 2023 in order to put together all the Tuareg um, communities in kind of an alliance with the government against terrorism. This is not something in which our ministry is directly involved. Of course, uh, this NGO, with, which support peace or, uh, or uh, Africa and, uh, and uh, progress, etc., they are their own activities, and we are not necessarily involved in all of them. Let, let's imagine Sant'Egidio. Sant'Egidio make a lot of activities, a lot of initiatives, but we are not involved in every, every one, every single action. So we know that this initiative exists. I believe that this standby position now. So that's what I can say at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me read one last question. Uh, maybe Nyagale might want to answer this, but um, any of you. Uh, it's by Luis. Uh, there's a fear of possible spillovers of the crisis in coastal states, from Cote d'Ivoire to Benin. Uh, what would this mean and imply for foreign actors? Uh, yes, uh, indeed, uh, this is a very worrying uh, tendency that uh, we can uh, see uh, today. Um, I think that uh, it is uh, first uh, important to uh, look at the kind of uh, capacities that coastal countries uh, do have presently, which are definitely not the same as uh, the one of uh, Central Sahel uh, countries uh, in, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, in, uh, in Togo, uh, I, in particular in Togo, because uh, you do have um, 
strong uh, central states uh, with a rather uh, authoritarian approach in Benin as well, uh, which could, parad not paradoxically, but uh, objectively, uh, facilitate uh, the kind of fight uh, that uh, can be conducted. And uh, if I'm stressing this aspect, uh, this is because I think that today international partners uh, are, uh, are clearly uh, before a clear choice. Uh, they can decide uh, to stay and to become, in fact, true to the principles that they are supposed to have promoted for years uh, in terms of uh, democracy and uh, support to human rights. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, their double standard uh, approach uh, has been uh, very harmful and has been exploited by uh, actors such as uh, Russia's or uh, other uh, authoritarian uh, states. Or the other uh, choice they do have is to work with uh, much more uh, authoritarian countries uh, uh, which have not decided to stay or to 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 become uh, democratic in, in, in essence. And I think uh, it is a very difficult choice, uh, but with which we have uh, to be done because uh, it seems to me that in the current environment uh, it is absolutely impossible for Western uh, partners to stay uh, in a kind of uh, ambiguity and such an um, and such a choice definitely will have uh, an impact on the kind of uh, security assistance uh, which could be uh, provided. Thank you, Niagale. Are there any reactions, any points um, left that uh, any of you might uh, want to intervene before we close? Ivan. Yeah, just a quick word to say that uh, we're having this discussion on geopolitical dimensions of the crisis in the Sahel, but um, the priority and what perhaps our countries should focus on is also the humanitarian situation, which is absolutely dreadful right now. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, so we try to bring some attention to a crisis that um, doesn't get much, uh, particularly with the Ukrainian crisis, um, with the media focusing on, on, on the Ukrainian crisis. Thank you very much to our panelists for helping us understand uh, this very complex situation. Thank you uh, to, to Ambassador Mistretta also for taking part to the discussion. Uh, and thank you to our audience, to everybody. Have a good evening.